I, I, you're right. I, I do have a choice, but I tell myself I don't have a choice. Okay. All right. Okay. So, so, so my, my choice in dealing with my reality and coming to terms with my reality is you're going to make the best of it. You are going to find motivation in defeat. You are going to find motivation in the worst things that happen to you. Because if you don't, then what kind of life are you going to live? And the reality is this, is that life happens. Life happens to all of us. It doesn't matter what you think your plan is or what you think you want to have happen. It doesn't matter what it is. Odds are somebody's already been through it. There's a group of people that have been through it. And now it's, it's less about being embarrassed about what your reality is and just saying, hey, this is who I am. This is where I come from. These are decisions that I've made. This is the past. These are the things that were my fault. These are the things that weren't my fault. But how do I grow and how do I get better? And oh my gosh, wait, I'm not alone. Wait, a lot, a lot of other people have done the same things I have? Most of us never learned how to train our brains, which is why most of us needlessly settle, struggle, and worse, suffer. My name is Chris Doris, and I want to make brain training mainstream. This is my series, Tough Talks, Conversations on Mental Toughness. I'm interviewing badasses from all walks of life on what mental toughness means to them and their unique approaches to strengthening their minds. Hey guys, welcome back to Tough Talks, Conversations on Mental Toughness. I'm your host, Chris Doris, and I am super pumped, super pumped to share with you our guest today, former Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah, that's right. That's my team. You know it. Go Birds. Former long snapper for the Philadelphia Eagles, John Dornboss. If you haven't heard of him, if you don't know him from football fame, because he actually holds the record for most consecutive games played I think for actually all four of the major Philadelphia sports teams not just the Eagles 162 consecutive games he's gone to the Pro Bowl twice he's won all these awards and um, a story that I can't wait to ask him about or have him tell is that you know the reason he's not playing football anymore is uh, that he he got traded that's an interesting thing by itself. Long snappers don't get tra- Wait till you hear his response to that fact that he's getting traded. Wait till you hear the way he <laughs> chose to respond to discovering that he was getting traded. He didn't want to be traded. So anyway, he gets traded. When you get traded, what has to happen is you need to get a physical. Well, you know what? I'm not going to spoil it. I'll let him just tell you all that. So uh, he is now retired from the NFL and he's crushing it in so many other ways. He is, um, he competed. In season 11, he made it to the finals of America's Got Talent. He ended up finishing third. And uh, his final trick is just this, like, it's so emotional. God, that's what I love about the way he uses magic to actually communicate really important messages on how to choose to interpret life. (laughs) So good. So good. So he is like the epitome of that for me. And I've been trying to get him on the show for a while. It's not that, like he said, no, it's just hard to get in touch with him because he's like ridiculous. He's on the Ellen show like every day. <laughs> and that's actually really beautiful. Like the relationship that he has with her. He's basically Ellen DeGeneres is like magician. <laughs> he's on there all the time. You can tell they love each other. And, and, and it's like they're kindred spirits because they, they both just love humans and, and bring up the vibe. Ah, oh, I'm so happy to share you with him. This is his new book where I've studied this. This is an, it's called Life is Magic and you can get it at lifeismagic.com. And he's got a really cool website too, johndurenboss.com. And, and there's an offer that I'll tell you about. I'll just put it in the show notes. Uh, you can get a signed, you can get like a, a book plate to put in the front. He'll sign it for you if you just um, send a self-addressed stamp to his manager, which I'll, I'll share that, those details with you uh, later on. All right, folks, with no further ado, let's go find the man. I think we're going to have a pretty good story hour. And there he is, the man, the magician, the Philly legend, Mr. John Dorenbos. What's up, man? Uh, <laughs> excuse me. Sorry. <laughs> What's going on? Thanks for having me. <laughs> Way to kick it off. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> Gesundheit. Yeah. So, um... I gave, I don't think a lot of people, there is a, a, a diminishing number of human beings who need to have you introduced. And, uh, but I did introduce you uh, just a second ago to our audience. And I just, I, I really want to say thanks for making time because this is a true gift. And you know, the whole reason I even do this Tough Talks podcast is in service, completely in service, right? Uh, in service to people more specifically, 
with respect to the fact that, uh, you know, none of us learned in grade school. I don't know. I won't speak for you. Maybe you correct me if I'm wrong, but I sure as shit didn't ever have a class on how to use my mind well, M even more so on how to choose to interpret reality. And that's a big goddamn deal. Like how to choose, and I'm, I'm not saying this to you for you. Uh, this is like context creation for our conversation, you know, for the audience. We weren't educated on how to choose to interpret realities in ways that service that have us be amazing. In fact, in fact, just the opposite. And I can't wait to hear you speak to this. We have actually all been conditioned or taught otherwise, which is to play victim of circumstance. And I know you have a lot to say about that. I got your book and I've been reading, I've been studying this puppy. Oh man. Well, I'll tell you what, great job, dude. Thank you. Thank you. This is moving. I mean, I, you know, you cover, you get, you get all the feels in here, bro. It was, you know? years, it was years in the making. And, and, you know, when I thought that it was over, but yet it was missing something, something happened in my life to where we just kept writing and writing and writing. So uh, that is a full revelation. I'm, I'm really proud of that. You talk about legacy and what you're doing to, to pay it forward. And uh, when you're gone, the difference you could make. You know, as I was writing that book and I realized that my wife and I were pregnant uh, and, you know, not to get too far ahead. And then I, I chose to go see my dad. I realized that I was writing my story for my daughter. And I realized that if I weren't to make it as long as I want in this life, she'll forever know who her dad is through those words, all up into the point that literally she was born. Everything that was me before we met. So um, hmm. it was super emotional and I'm, I'm really proud of it. And that's... That's my story. And writing a book is a big undertaking. It's a big responsibility and a big undertaking. And uh, thank you for reading it. Yeah, of course, man. Well, thank you for writing it. And we'll, we'll be referencing it. There's a few pages that I marked here. Uh, the book, by the way, for those listening on the audio version, is called Life is Magic. And it's available at lifeismagic.com. And I'll reiterate that later. So let's, let's start with, um, can we, if you're cool with this, man, and totally redirect if you're not, uh, with the tragedy. Mm-hmm. Can we go there? Yeah, I'm, I'm an open book, man. I, 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 I can tell. So when you were 12, you had an unthinkable event occur. <clears throat> can you tell us about it? Yeah, well, so b before we get into it, this, you know, a lot of people, and, and yourself included, they, they, they're kind of hesitant. And they're like, hey, if you're cool with it, mm. I'd like to talk about it. Mm -hmm. But that that right there, with how you open this this interview, it was about coming to terms with your reality, having to deal with your reality. And really it's about being honest with your reality. And so all of a sudden when all those take place, you, you you're okay talking about things mm -hmm. because embarrassment is no longer an issue. Embarrassment no longer drives the defense mechanism to deflect. And so I'm okay with my reality. I'm okay with what happened to me because, because you ready? I don't have a choice. I, I, oh, that's I an interesting thing for for me to hear to you say. Maybe I should let you elaborate because you were you use the word choice a whole lot. So, yeah, my, my, what, what do you mean my, you're not a choice? My, my, well, okay, you're right. You know what I do? You, have you a could choice. totally to, choose to be a victim, but you're the opposite of that. Yeah, I, I you're right. I, I do have a choice, but I tell myself I don't have a choice. Okay, all right. Okay, so I get so, that. so my my choice in dealing with my reality and coming to terms with my reality is you're going to make the best of it. You are going to find motivation in defeat. You are going to find motivation in the worst things that happen to you. Because if you don't, then what kind of life are you going to live? And the reality is this, is that life happens. Life happens to all of us. It doesn't matter what you think your plan is or what you think you want to have happen. It doesn't matter what it is. Odds are somebody's already been through it. There's a group of people that have been through it. And now it's, it's less about being embarrassed about what your reality is and just saying, hey, this is who I am, this is where I come from, these are decisions that I've made, this is the past, these are the things that were my fault, these are the things that weren't my fault, but how do I grow and how do I get better? And oh my gosh, wait, I'm not alone. Wait, a lot, a lot of other people have done the same things I have. So now let's all, let's all get out of this together. And I truly believe that if we can find motivation in the worst things that happen to us, because those things have already happened. So whether we wanna sit there and play the victim card and make excuses, and if that's our way of showing the world that because here, here's the other thing that, I, uh, that I've observed, and I'm not classifying any groups of people, but I have observed some individuals over my path of speaking and, and talking to people that I think some people think that 
and then and, and we're, we're kind of veering off here but uh, i think coming to terms with your reality is also having a, a very deep sense of forgiveness in a lot of different aspects of life and i think a lot of people think that if they play the victim then that means that the world thinks that they care more right so if i choose not to forget somebody that betrayed me it's because i care it's because i believe in something it's because if i forgive i'm weak and now i just redefined what those terms were. I redefined what it means to come to terms with my own reality. I redefined what it means to uh, have closure and be okay with closure and change. And I redefined what forgiveness means. Let, yeah, okay, and I wanna get to that <clears throat> because there's some stuff at the end, towards the very end of the book about what I call divine selfishness is forgiving for you. Yep. Right, and, and I told, we have to get to that, we will. But, yeah. but let, let's back up and uh, like share yeah, for yeah, those right. of you that don't know the deal. Well, yeah, drop the so bomb. Would, yeah, and, so, and let me let me preface it just a tiny bit, okay, by saying what you're about to share with, with those who are listening or watching that that haven't heard this story. This is fucking hardcore. Yeah, and and, and you of anyone would have very legitimate reasons to stay in the victim state forever. A lot of people would think that. Yeah. Yeah, so I was, uh, I lived in a, in a loving home. Uh, I had two great parents. My dad was my hero for all the reasons that you would hope that a little boy looks up to his dad, played catch every day, president of Little League, coached my teams, um, and, you know, and, and I wanted to be just like him. Uh, my mom volunteered at my elementary school and taught a reading program. My reading comprehension was bad and still is really bad. And so I was placed in like the, the special learning group. Uh, and then they started a reading program that my mom helped that helped kids learn more visually and uh, a book club and a reading club. And kids liked my mom. And so I felt like at a young age, my mom, and, and this is me looking back, but my mom kind of showed me that you can be different. You can be yeah. special and still have a place in this world and still have a role in this world. Mm -hmm. And so I went home at 12 years old. I was across the street playing at a friend's house. And when I went home, my dad had murdered my mother out of nowhere. And it wasn't, it wasn't good. And so he used a bench grinder and a sledgehammer, um, put her in a sleeping bag and, and put her in the trunk of his car. So he kept me from the garage. The next morning I went to a baseball camp and he turned himself in. Uh, he was tried for second degree murder. Uh, of which I, I learned later in life that in the state of Washington, the max penalty for second degree murder was 13 years at the time. Wow. So he knew going in that he was only going to get 13 years max. Right. So the defense became uh, a self-defense, right? Mm -hmm. uh, agree or disagree. It doesn't really matter. That was his plea. And uh, he, since he turned himself in, it wasn't about whether he did it or not. It was about what was the motivation and what was going to be the sentencing. Uh, they thought about first degree. But first degree one is really hard to prove. I mean, first degree means it's premeditated. It means that you basically wrote a letter that said, hey, at this time, I'm going to do this. Okay. Premeditated is, you know, you go hire an undercover agent to do a hit and you pay that person to execute, right? It, that's premeditation. So they went for second degree. Uh, he was found guilty, sentenced to 13 years. Uh, he served uh, like 11 of that 13. And then he was released. He, he went to prison in uh, 92, 93, and he was released around what, 04, 05? And uh, my life changed forever. Now, when I listen to you speak on that and, and read you write on that, <clears throat> and listen to you in other podcast interviews and I hear you talk about it, it sounds to me as if somewhere along the line, you had some really profound influence on how to not be a victim. But I'm not clear on what that influence, is it like, how did you learn this? To, to take such extreme tragedy, okay, that, that humans will uniformly agree is, is incomprehensibly tragic, right? Yeah. And still yeah. not play victim. Where did, where did right. this learning come from? All right, so this is kind of me playing Monday quarterback where you, you kind of look back on your life in, in third person. Um, and, and my evaluation, it's done in a way of whether I wanted this to happen or not, it happened. So now it's no longer about, um, being emotional about it in a sense of victim, right? Now it's, now it's, how do we get out of it? And when I look back, I had a lot of things going for me and the things that were going for me is I was old enough to, I was 12. 
And I was old enough to understand, but I was young enough to still be influenced. And I was young enough to mm -hmm. still have somebody show me the way and, mm -hmm. and follow mm -hmm. and, and not know uh, that I had a choice, right? So if I was 18, 19, 20, well, then you're, you're, already, you're already exposed to the evil side of the world. And now you're also exposed to this idea of choice. No, I don't have to do that. Mm. No, I don't have to do that. I don't have to do anything. I can do whatever I want. Well, at 12, you're old enough to understand. You're old enough to comprehend. But I don't know if I was old enough to understand that I had a choice to just say, no, I'm not doing this and just rebel. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what that was. So instead, my mom's sister, um, Susan, and my grandparents uh, have loved me and, and taken care of me and, and shown me guidance. And then we spent, my sister and I spent about seven, eight months in a temporary foster home mm -hmm. uh, to finish out the, the, the school year. And then we were going to move down with my aunt into Southern California. Well, during that time, uh, we had therapy. And it was the most intense experiential therapy you could possibly imagine. Wow. Uh, we would go multiple times a week, my sister and I individually, and then her and I would do a group session with the therapist, what would be her and I and the therapist. And uh, that I think I contribute to probably giving me the fundamentals and the mindset and the toolbox, if you will, mm -hmm. to have emotional awareness, to have thank, to be thankful, to have forgiveness, to be able to process, um, the things I learned in that therapy. So forgive this. Have you completely forgiven your father? Yeah. Yeah, I have. And uh, I, I think for me, it was about redefining what that term is. Now this is deep, right? Yeah, okay, this is, good. Bring it. And there's a lot of different layers. Uh, I had to forgive myself first. And then I wanted to forgive my dad to just have closure with that, that part of my life. And so, and for me, uh, and you touched upon this earlier, to me, forgiveness became about me. It became about not for him, not for anybody else. It became about me coming to closure, me having, to, uh, coming to terms with my reality and me being okay with, with what happened. Yeah. And it's so, and, and you know what else it was for me? A commitment to not repeat the bad. What do you, you know, mean? For me, well, for me, having forgiving my dad was also like this internal commitment that I won't repeat the mistakes he made, that I won't become that. And it was like my way of standing in front of him and making that deal with myself, that I will be better, that I, I will do better in this world. I will be a better father. I will be a better husband, and I'll try to be a better person. Now, am I perfect? No. Um, so, so going back to forgiveness, right? So I had to forgive myself because I had guilt for a while when I was in my 20s. Mm. Uh, about whether my mom would understand. And if she was here, you know, because it's all about picking sides, right? When people get divorced, you got to pick a side. You can't be friends with both, right? That's society telling us that. So all of a sudden it was like, if I forgive my dad, is, is my mom going to be mad at me, whether she's in heaven or not? Is my family going to be mad at me? Will anybody understand? Mm. And I came to this realization mm. that, you know what? I don't really care. I don't really care if you understand. In fact, um, mm. For those that have not read the book, uh, my wife gets pregnant. Uh, I'm, I'm 30 at the time. I was 38, I guess, 37, 38, I, I think, and um, 38. And I realized that I wanted to go see my dad and forgive him. And I wanted to do that when she was literally about a month or two from delivering my daughter. And I realized that I thought about it for years, but I'd never taken action on it. Um, and I didn't tell anybody. I told my wife. Yeah. That was it. And the reason is, for the first time, I didn't care what anybody thought. I really didn't care if you agreed with it. I didn't care if you supported it. I didn't care if you disagreed with it and didn't support it. Mm -hmm. Anybody else's opinion was completely irrelevant to, to my path. And so I didn't tell anybody. And uh, what I did is, well, I'm, okay, we're going to go back even further now because this is, this is life coming full circle. And I know I'm kind of rambling on here, but there's a lot of different layers to this forgiveness. So uh, when I was in therapy... Uh, my dad's trial was going on. The therapist wanted my sister and I to see the autopsy photos and everybody thought he was crazy. I mean, everybody thought this guy was crazy and they were all dead set against it. And so when the trial was happening, uh, there was news cameras everywhere and it was, you know, uh, on the TV up in Seattle and the news, it was front page everywhere. And so when that part of the trial came where they were going to show the autopsy photos of my mom, the pictures were angled in a way that only the jurors could see no cameras, nobody watching, nobody sitting in. Mm -hmm. And my therapist got upset. 
So he went to court and my sister and I became the first minors to get a private court order to view an autopsy photo. And so we drove to the, uh, uh, the prosecutor's office. She walked in and she took a folder and she kind of set it on the table, kind of just tossed it on the table. And uh, she was a wonderful lady. Uh, they, they were a great team. But she looked at the therapist and she said, I can't believe you're doing this to these kids. And then she walked out. And so when the door closed and it was just my therapist and my sister and I, 12 years old, my sister was 15, and a folder that contained the autopsy photos of my mom who'd just been beaten to death. I mean, think about this, right? Yeah. My therapist looked at my sister and I and goes, all these people think I'm crazy. But you know what the reality is? I don't really care if you look at them. But why should anybody else decide your life? It's your life, kid. Well, why should anybody else decide whether you want to see these pictures or not? It's your life. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get up and walk out this room. You want to peek, peek. If you don't, don't. I won't ask. But I'm going to tell you this. If you decide to look in this folder, there might be a day where you want to sit down with your dad. And it's a very unpopular thing right now. And people aren't going to understand this, but I've, I've lived in this world a long time. And there might be a day when you're 30, 40, 50 years old, maybe you have kids, maybe you don't, that you want to sit down and have a conversation with your dad. If you decide to do that and you look at these pictures, it'll be for reasons other than wanting to know what happened. And that's a powerful thing, kid. You're not going to wonder your whole life what happened. You're not going to sit in front of your dad and have him lie mm. to you about what happened because you're going to see it. So mm. if you ever decide to see him, it'll be for reasons other than wanting to know what happened. Mm. So he got up and he left. And at 12 years old, I looked. And it was the worst thing I've ever seen. Um, it was probably the worst day of my life. And uh, I closed the folder and I don't have an explanation for this, but I, I don't, rem I, and I kept a journal and we went through it when I wrote the book. Um, I don't, I didn't write about it, nor do I have any recollection of actually having nightmares about it. And I guess looking back that that's, I, I don't know why, but that's just the case. In fact, I didn't really ever think about it ever again until I was on the plane to go see my dad. And I looked out the window and I remember kind of literally like smirking and smiling and chuckling, thinking of my therapist saying, that son mm. of a bitch, <laughs> here I am going to see my dad mm -hmm. for reasons other than wanting to know what happened. Not only that, but I didn't have anger. I didn't have resentment. I didn't have probably all these feelings that would come with wanting answers to what happened. Does that, does that make sense? So if, you, if mean, you, have, you mean when you were going to see him, you didn't have that anger. You must yeah. have sure as hell had plenty of anger. Oh, I did over the years. years but, when I, right? but when I was on the plane going to see my dad, <clears throat> yeah. it was for reasons other than wanting to know what happened. And I believe in my heart that because of that, I didn't have years of wondering. I didn't have years of resentment. I'd already kind of resolved that internally. And so because I knew what happened, I, I, I there, 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 the expectation and the, uh, the shock factor, all that goes away because you know, you, you have the reality. You, mm -hmm. You've come to terms with it. You've had closure. And so when I was going to see my dad, um, I was going, and it's funny because on, on my phone, I had my, my headphones in and, and a, a Johnny, a Johnny Cash song came in and it was, you know, basically just, Hey, walk, walk with your heart open. And, and basically you will not walk alone, right? You will, not, you will not walk alone. Right. So, and I felt that, I felt that my mom was with me. I felt that she understood and uh, I kind of flipped it on her and said, hey, if you want me to be the man you want me to be, I got to do this. And so now what? You know what I mean? So I mean, Yeah. So, and you're looking for the pennies. <laughs> yeah. That's it, man. That's it. Right? It, it, yeah. Yeah. Right. And so I sat down with my dad for five and a half hours and uh, I literally wrote a game plan out. Wait, just like how I, long? We, we sat down for five and a half hours. Wow. That's how long I sat with him, yeah. I don't think I noticed that part. Yeah. I mean, I saw the Well, the, you know what? There, this, so, uh, insane, this picture is... I mean, I could, man. Yeah. You know, you know my, I, I showed that picture to my wife. So that's my dad and I after 27 years of not seeing each other. So I showed that picture to my wife and she literally was like, that, that picture's like creepy. Right. And I was expecting her to say, cause of my dad. Oh and no, man. Said, Look at your face. She said, it's the only picture I've ever seen I'm... that you're not smiling. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I mean, that's obviously he's got this big old grin. Yeah. Well, and two, two different I mean, places. I can't. I can't. I don't want to put any words. In your mouth. I get that. I mean, I stared at this picture the first time I I leafed this page. 
I was just checking you out. And, and, and I mean, this is a captivating photo. So uh, here, here's the reality of that picture. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to me seeing him, I, I get asked to take, we, we go out in public and I get asked all the time, hey, can I get a picture with you, John? John and, yeah, cool. And I, I literally, in an embarrassing way, got in picture mode. And my dad and I stood there and I started to smile because habit. Like there's a camera, smile, right? right you just do right, it a hundred right, times a day for right. people. And, and then before the picture was taken, I go, wait a minute, this is, this is weird. Yeah, like this is yeah. weird because I was posing for my own picture. Oh, man, and man. instead I was like, what am I smiling about? And what is, what is, what is the meaning? And again, it's deep reflection. So yeah, stop, yeah. take a moment, realize the moment. And I was like, I just, I blinked. And I said, when I open my eyes, just however my expression is, that's what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm feeling right now. And, and it was the feeling of, holy shit, I just did something that I never thought I would do. And I'm about to tell my wife that I just had lunch with my dad. <laughs> Which is very beautiful. I just had lunch with my dad. I got a little weepy when I read that. I, you know, just, so, had, I uh, just had lunch with my dad. Yeah, you man, never got to say that. I never got to say that. And uh, in, in the, the, uh, the dedication to the book, this is going to get me choked up. The dedication to the book is just that. It's to my daughter and it's, you'll always be able to have lunch with your dad. I love that. I, I promise you I was crying when I read that. And that, that, that is a lot deeper than just lunch. You know, I, when you read yeah. the book, you think about what exactly that means. And you know what? A friend of mine gave me a great idea. Okay. And they were like, hey, your next book, you should write a children's book. But it might take you years to write. And I'm going to cry. That's and I go, cool, what, what do you mean? And he said, uh, every time you take your daughter to lunch, you, you and her should invent a story. And she should illustrate it. And the book should be called Lunch with Daddy. Ha. And I was <laughs> like, wow. That's so, so good. Uh, I think when my daughter and I, as, as she grows up, we're going to go to lunches. and <laughs> That's brilliant. Make up stories. Well, that friend of yours is a genius, and I love that idea. And thank you. I would just interrupt the whole conversation right now just to acknowledge you. Okay, d delete the word just. Stupid in that sentence. It doesn't belong. To acknowledge you for how powerful you're being with, through your transparency. You are truly a servant you know, to the world, and, and I love you for that. I've never, this is the first time I ever talked to you in my life. Yeah. I know that I love you, dude. Well, Let's go. There, were, there were people that helped me. And then when I got into magic, uh, my rookie year, I went to the Buffalo. Well, I got into magic when I was a kid. And we'll yeah. get to that. And then rookie year, 2003, I met a guy named Kevin Elko. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll never forget, man. We're in the weight room of the Buffalo Bills. And he says, hey, John, um, you know that uh, this, is, <laughs> this is this quote. And I actually, I, I might do it. Uh, okay. okay. He goes, you know that stupid trick you do with the pencil and dollar? <laughs> and I go, I mean, I, I actually think it's kind of cool. But yeah, yeah. He goes, I got to. He goes, I got to speak to these bankers and this financial group. Hey, will you do that trick? Because they're money people. And will you tell a little bit about your story and, you know, maybe where you come from and how you got into college and I'll, I'll, I'll give you this amount of money. And I was like, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> and so we, we do it. Right. And uh, I get a ton of, of mail from that group of people. And it was my first time speaking. Right. Instead of just doing magic. <laughs> so afterwards he goes, Hey, look, kid, the magic's cute. I get it. You need to be a speaker. Like I'm going <laughs> to tell you right now, stop. Stop. If you want to do magic, you need to do magic within your speaking. And you need to tell your story because I think people will, will oh, listen yeah. to you. Yeah, man. And, and everything that you want as a magician, you can still get that, that fun urge and you can still have that creative side. But I think you should book yourself as a speaker. My life's never been the same since. Best advice I was ever given. Ah, good on them and good on you because that's one of the, my favorite things about you is that it's like I watch – you know, I watch the clips, right? Or I watch you on Ellen. I watch you wherever. And, um, and you're, you move people, dude. I mean, right. I mean, that's the deal, right? It's like you're bringing, you know, what, what you said, I got to ask you this on, um, in the finals of America's got talent, right? The, where did that come from? Can I read right, some me, of it? No, hold, you, you want to know the backstory to this? Yeah, I sure as hell do. This is way deeper than that. It, first of all, it's right. the most proud of any appearance of any performance I've ever done in my life. Right. Most proud. Are you giving me goosebumps right now? All right. So I make it to the finals of America's got talent. I'm in training camp and I call David Copperfield 
right? Friend of a friend had his number. I call him. Calls me back. <laughs> That's wild. The guy, the guy calls me back. That's now I'm cool. blown away. Right. And I actually called because I was trying to, uh, look, I'm just throwing out ideas, right? I'm throwing it on a wall and I'm, I'm going to see what I'm going to do for the finals of America's Got Talent. I got limited time. So I said, hey, Dave, uh, nobody covers magicians. Like m musicians cover other musicians. But like in magic, you don't cover somebody. You do this. And I would love to do like a tribute to you because it, it, it affected my life. And I would love to do something and kind of cover you. Mm. And he goes, first of all, uh, I think you might be the only person that's ever called and asked permission. And I really respect that. And I, I thank you for that. Uh, two, no, you can't do that. I was like, ah. <laughs> but, and, but he said this. He goes, but, you know, maybe you could do this, 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 or this. And I go, you know what, dude? I appreciate you taking the time to call me, and I'll, I'll figure something out. So I finally realized that I'd been running around and doing these, like, uh, energetic performances. I wanted to be a rock star. I can't sing, I can't dance, and I can't play an instrument. So check that off the list. But it was time for me to do my ballad. And so what was it going to be? And so uh, I ended up putting that routine together. And it was a routine with the concept of don't hate, don't blame, and forgive. Mm -hmm. And how magic saved me as a kid. Now, here's what happened. And I am not making this up. I speak about this. I have a picture of the mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. I'm rehearsing. And a picture fell off our bookshelf. And I, I, I heard it, but I didn't acknowledge it. My wife says, holy shit, turn around. And so what happened is I rehearsed this routine and I stood up and I was like, this ain't good enough. Like, I'm not going to win. And so the, the picture falls. And at the moment that I said, I'm, I'm, this isn't good enough, the picture falls and it's a picture of my mom. And, I. and we were both just floored, blown away. And my wife and I looked at each other and, and there was a guy named Bill Malone, who I, I've become friends with, who was a card guy that was on TV back in the early 90s, influenced me. And, and uh, my wife and I started talking like, hey, maybe it's not about winning and losing. Maybe this is your chance to be Bill Malone. You're going to be on the biggest show on television. You're going to do a card trick and you're going to influence somebody or affect somebody's life like he affected yours. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe you are going to win and that's, that's winning, right? So here's the other uh, underlined thing that I'm most proud of. When, my, uh, when my, my mom died and my dad's trial started, I've bitten my nails so bad ever since. Mm -hmm. And I, can't, I, I tried everything. I tried everything to quit. And I, 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 I couldn't. Like I literally – and so when I got into magic – I got really good at the slights and I got really good at my audience management and my talking. And I was a really fast performer and every trick was a finale. Like every trick was literally amazing because I was so self-conscious that people were going to stare at my nails and I hated them and they were, I just hated them. Wow. So I meet my wife um, and I changed some things about me that I, I didn't like and for the good. And she just brought out the, the best in me and I look down, and after meeting my wife, guess what? I don't do no more. Ha! And so <laughs> I had a baby. Um, and how about this? Huh. America's Got Talent. The finals hmm. was the first time in my life that I did a card trick slow, and I was finally proud of my hands. Wow! And the whole world saw it. That's beautiful. Wow, well, there's so many stories in the story. So, yeah. can you recite a little bit of the the, the language that you were using? Ooh, so, well, so I, mean, I, I had to read it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I remember it, you know, it's, it's I bet. probably articulated better in the book because we spent time writing that, you know, I'll let you read it. Oh, this is the, okay. So this is the forgiveness stuff. Oh, remind me to ask you, um, I'll throw it out now. By any chance, have you ever heard of a book called left to tell? No. It's written by a woman that, oh, I think you might want to check it out. Uh, Left to Tell. And it's, it's written by a woman named Immaculé Ilabegiza. That's a tough one. But um, she's from Rwanda, and she's a survivor of the Rwandan Holocaust that happened in 1994 in the summer that the United States did not cover because we're all too busy watching goddamn soccer. Uh, I, have, I have actually heard this. I've heard of this story, and I've heard – Okay. Yeah, she's aware. Also, I'm not red, but I'm aware. Yeah, well, it's a beautiful. And I mean, I was reminded multiple times of it. The bottom line is, <clears throat> is that she witnessed her entire family get slaughtered. The, only one of her many siblings didn't because he was out of the country when this whole thing went down. And she literally heard like her parents being slaughtered outside of the house in which she was hiding. And when the whole thing was over, uh, the chief of police brought her to the prison where the dude who had murdered her family was in jail. 
and and you know he took her to the room and said i'm just gonna like leave and you what nothing what you no want. one's ever and she said you don't have to leave and and this dude <clears throat> the guy who killed her family is on his knees and she just puts her hands on his shoulders and said i forgive you it's deep man yeah i would love to hear you and her have a conversation deep but you know what she did it for herself uh that's it let's go there i can't find that quote but you but whatever we'll get Tell me, tell, let's go there. Cause we referenced that earlier, right? She did it for herself. So, so did you yeah. preach. Uh, so I, and I'm I, listening, I but I want to try to find this stuff. So I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm listening. So I, I realized that I, I needed forgiveness for myself. And what I did is I, I redefined what forgiveness means. I didn't care about anybody's approval. I didn't care what other people think. I think a lot of people think forgiveness is about winning and losing. It's about one upping. If I forgive, I show weakness. If I forgive, that person wins. If I forgive, then we all forget hoity-doity and we all go living on our merry lives. Okay. And to me, I realized that forgiveness means I'm okay with where I'm at. I'm okay with where I come from. I'm happy with who I am and the decisions that I make. And I'm no longer going to let somebody in my life that's no longer in my life affect my life. Think about that. How many of us mm. know people that get divorced, they're five, 10 years out, and they still have such bitterness and resentment for an individual that they haven't seen or talked to in mm -hmm. years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All that did is take time away from you. So now the whole winning and losing, who's really winning? Your time. Your mm. time is all you have. We'll make money, we'll spend money, we'll win money, we'll lose money. We'll never be able to buy our time back. Mm. So what do you have to do? That's, to a, have that's a mic drop. That's beautiful. Right. Yeah. Let's slow that down for a second. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So and if we're going to really like really reduce this down, we're saying the choice to not forget is a stupid waste of your precious time. Yeah. And, and, and well, not, right. not forgive, right? It, it, it is. And, and what I mean by that is for me, having forgiveness in my dad was me closing a chapter of my life. And it just so happened for me, the timing was right before I was about to become a dad. And what I wanted to do and the, and, the, and the decision that I made to go sit and have lunch with him was I wanted to stare at him and I wanted to look at him and I wanted to talk to him and I wanted to hear his voice and I wanted to feel everything about what had happened, where I came from, the decisions that he made, what could have been, what should have been. Like how many people in that restaurant were looking at us thinking we were just a father and son having lunch and had no idea what the backstory was. Right. And, and then there, there was a part of me where I blinked and I forgot everything. And I just wanted to sit and have lunch with my dad because I just never did, right? And so that lasted like five seconds, <laughs> right? Um, but I did all that to realize how special it was that I was about to become that dad to somebody mm -hmm. else mm -hmm. and to appreciate everything that I missed out on. And instead of have resentment and bitterness and become a victim of, oh, I don't have a daddy card, I had to find motivation in the worst thing that happened to me to make this world better for somebody else. And that's my daughter and my wife. And when I did that, uh, hours into the conversation, I also forgave him for something interesting. And this was enough for me to have closure. I forgave him for being lost and I forgave him for making mistakes. And both of which I have made many. And I looked at him and I said, dad, I forgive you. And he, it was probably the one point in the conversation that he kind of looked up and was like, holy shit, right? Mm -hmm. um, it was the one point in the conversation that I think kind of his eyes watered over a little bit. Um, and I said, I forgive you for being lost. I, know, I forgive you for making a mistake. And we're good. And so you're, you're here. And we're good. We're good. And, 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 what I, what I, and, and you know what's interesting is now that you just said that, <laughs> My, 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 cause it was probably just interpreted and I, I never looked at it this way, but I, I think I sensed it from you. It wasn't dad and dad, you and I are good. It was my family, your daughter, my brother, my sister. We're good. Mm -hmm. We're good. Mm -hmm. and, and, and you're here. So I hope you're actually helping people that were in your shoes and trying to make this world a better place. And, uh, when I left, uh, you talk about a whirlwind of emotion that hit me differently every day for 
for months, months. Mm. Wow. And I realized that the forgiveness was about me. The forgiveness was about, like I said, coming to terms with my own reality and taking a positive out of it. And then I realized something beautiful, something that I literally, it took me by surprise and I went outside and I bawled my eyes out. But instead of having resentment for not having him in my life as a father, I now get to live that and experience that through both my daughter's eyes and my eyes. And so I never missed out. I'm just going to see it from a different perspective and I'm going to live it. Can everyone please take that right there and stop. This is why I had to have you on the show, man, because fuck, this is what you're choosing. God, you're so good at this. You take anything and, and craft it like an alchemist. You'll mold it into something spectacular. That's a choice. Well, and, and, okay, here's the choice. There's two choices that I make. Mm-hmm. Happiness is not, a, not an emotion. Happiness is a, is a choice. It's a decision. Mm -hmm. And the other decision is I'm going to spend more time looking at the things that I'm thankful for and the opportunity than I am the things that I resent and that I, I don't have. Amen. It's a choice. And so I'm going to choose to see, oh, are you ready for this one? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. This, this sentence right here. This sentence right here. Okay. Changes the game. Didn't happen to me. It happened for me. For me. Beautiful. You remind me of, you ever hear of this woman? Byron Katie? Oh, yeah. It didn't happen to me. It happened for me. Yeah, so now, that's her whole deal. It's like life happens, and, and, doesn't happen, and, okay. happens for us. And now that's hard to get. Now, hold on. Hold on. But, why, but why do but the people that don't get it? Yeah. Here's my, here's my interpretation. Okay. Because you take life personally. And what I mean by life, tragedy, life, the good, the bad, the ugly. And when things don't go your way, you take it personally as if life's ganging up on you, as if life doesn't like you, as if, as if everything was attacking you because you're you. No, 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 no. See, I don't, I don't look at it that way. See, life happens whether I want it to or not. The good happens and the bad happens. So now I, I got a junior college coach, coach. His name's Coach Hay. He asks us, hey, why do we have the names on the back of our jersey? So like an idiot, I raise my hand. It's easy, coach. There's a lot of guys out here. You don't know who's who. So you walk behind us. You glimpse my jersey. You walk in front of me. You wait a few seconds. Hey, Thornboss, get over here. I think you know me. I think you take the time to get to know my name. I'm going to try harder for you. He goes, John, that's the dumbest answer I've ever heard. <laughs> now, Coach Hay passed away a couple years ago, and, and he was one of my favorite coaches I've ever had. I was 19 years old. And they asked me to speak at his funeral, and I, I touched on this. And it's something that he told our team, which was a bunch of misfits. We were 0-40. That school was 0-40 over four years. We had the longest losing streak in college football history. Multiple guys were in and out of prison. We were the bad news bears. But he said something after a practice that changed my life. Two things. He goes, I, I have you guys run lines. And what that means is you stand on one sideline of a football field, you run to the other sideline, touch the white line, and you run back. So what do we do? We run a few. He blows the whistle. He gathers us all up. He goes, I, I ask you guys to run and touch the line. Half you guys are about two inches shy. I ask you to touch the line. If you're going to settle for those two inches there, you're going to settle for two inches everywhere in your life. And the next thing you know, you're going to be way behind and thinking the world's ganging up on you because you don't take care of the little things. Have a higher standard for yourself. And when you expect to touch a white line, don't fall short because you're just falling short on yourself. You're not cheating me. But guess what? If you don't hold it here, you ain't going to hold it out there. So have more discipline. And then he said, everything that happens in the game, everything that happens in the white lines of a field is going to happen in this world. You're going to get hit. It's going to be a late hit. It's going to be a bad hit. And maybe a whistle is not blown. You have a choice in that moment. That choice is the same choice that everyone has. But the choice that is made in that moment is what separates us. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care what your religion. I don't care where you're from, your title. It doesn't matter. We are all going to be face down in the mud on a hit that wasn't coming, that we knew was wrong, that everybody knew was wrong, and now what separates us? You stand up, you point fingers, you blame everybody. Well, guess what? You remember that name on the back of your jersey? I'll tell you why you have it on, your, uh, on the back of your jersey, because one, one day one of you might play on TV. You might play in a game where millions of people are watching, and the camera's going to zoom in on that play where you got hit wrong. And now you wake up, and all of a sudden you open your eyes, and you, and, and you get up, and you start pointing fingers and blaming everybody. You know what your name represents? Somebody that makes excuses, somebody that, that deflects and it's always other people's fault. Somebody that doesn't have a higher standard of accountability 
for themselves and other people have for them. And that's what you are in this world. Or you stand up, you pick your teammate up, you dust yourself off, you get in that huddle, and in 20 seconds, you come up with a better idea, a better plan, and as a team, you take the line to completely dominate and realize that it's okay. And realize that it's not always about whose fault it is, it's about coming together to make decisions to come out of it better than what you started. Now you do that. You become a teammate that your team would hate to lose, and you become a teammate that every opponent fears. Now you do that, you're gonna win in this life more than you lose. And you have and proven I'm, that right, son. So, so it comes down to that decision. Yes, the, now, can I, can I um, so my commitment to my audience is that they take stuff away from every one of these conversations like a thing, right? Like something that they can really use. It. I feel like today it's been forgiveness. Are okay. you ready? <clears throat> yes, are, you ready? are you ready for me just to throw this at you and then you can bullet point this? And... Come on. So, so it's about, it starts with this. Don't listen to yourself, talk to yourself. If Say that listen, again? It starts with don't listen to yourself, talk to yourself. Okay. Because every one of us, I think in, in moments where it's hard, we automatically play the victim. We automatically feel sorry for ourselves and we automatically get down. That's the voice in our own head. So instead, shut that voice up and don't listen to yourself. Talk to yourself. Yeah. And I literally, I literally walk around and I talk to myself all day. I tell myself where I'm going. I tell myself where I want to be. I tell myself who I'm going to be. And I tell, I, I literally tell myself my own story. And you know what else? All my passwords are where I want to be, where I'm going. So two things, my passwords are always changing, but I don't save any passwords for, an, for, for a reason. A lot of people save their passwords and, and so that way when they log on, it just goes right into the app or right into the, into the website. For me, I don't do it because I want to type it out and I want to hear it. Oh man, that's cool as shit. <laughs> I, want to, I, want to, I want to tell myself over and over and over every single day wow. where me and my family are going. Oh, that's so cool. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, it, it comes to fruition. It might not happen as quick as you want, but those things happen. Yeah, right. Thoughts become things. Um, I, right? Uh, that's, is that what you mean when you said, because you use it all the time, are you living in vision or are you living in circumstance? Is that, is that what we're talking about so, here? So here? Is that the vision, so the vision of the future that you're creating, the vision that, of the you that you're creating? Oh, okay, that's the being? moment. I use, this is yeah. how I talk to myself. This will be an explanation for another day. This is the product of some badass work that I did with one of the most amazing coaches on the planet. Right? These are two of them. And, uh, but this is the language. This is what I speak my way into every day. I also listen to it on my eye and my phone. It, it's none of it's really going to make sense, but it, it all makes volumes of sense to me. Every one of these things is a whole freaking story. Every one of these is a whole book. You know, what's really cool about what you just showed me. Yeah. What you and I got a lot in common. And what I mean by that is well, I'll take that as a massive ass compliment. <laughs> well, I, I, I glimpsed over what those things were. All right. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and I'll, I'll tell you what I observed here in two seconds. Yes. So I get a call. I get a call a couple of years ago about a genius conference. They want me to speak at a genius conference. And I, I kid you not. I literally go, oh, look, I think you guys got the wrong number. You know? <laughs> and then my, my buddies, my buddies were like, these guys must be idiots. Like they're not geniuses. These guys are idiots. And so they sent me a, and I, I agreed to do it. So they send me this questionnaire and they're like, we're going to make a tree, right? They're going to make this tree on my mind. And I had to answer these questions. One of the questions was list the top 100 things you're most proud of accomplishing. List your, your top 100 accomplishments is what it said. Um, I would say my first 75 were very similar to what you wrote. It wasn't the Pro Bowls, the Super Bowls, the records. Number one, I am happy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Number two, I make decisions to be happy. Number three, I understand that I don't listen to myself. I talk to myself. Number four, I'm proud of my name. Number mm. five, I'm okay with where I come from. And all my accomplishments that I'm most proud of were all internal. Mm. It wasn't materialistic. It wasn't any of that. And so they called me back and they were kind of blown away, right? They go, I, we've never seen this. Like, this is like, you know, and, and uh, what you wrote right there. Yeah. It's the things you want to do. It's, it's the things how you reflect. Choice. Yourself. Look, I, I saw it for two seconds. I am yeah. service. I, I am service. I am well, listen, here's another, here, check this out. Cause this is, I, so I read that those are all over my life. That's in my wallet there's a wallet size one there's one in my car this is a sacred space on top of my desk where nothing ever gets put on top of that like even my beloved eagles mug will not go on top of that nothing goes on top of that 
right? And, and so, because it's the truth that I'm speaking my way into, okay? Right? Some of it's totally true. Some of it's not even close to true yet, but it is in the moment, right? When I say it, I have it be my truth. That's another thing I want to talk to you about is the acting that you talk about, like on the sidelines. And what if I had to be the best part? We'll get to that. But this is me. I am divine grace. This is me speaking my way into my truth, man, right? I am that this is perfect. And that, that's a pretty big one. I am that this. What? What? This? What? This is perfect. I am that. The choice, that's the choice. Now, I wanna ask you a question that I thought about earlier, several times, okay? And this isn't like me thinking about people out there listening or watching, right? That might have had some serious ass tragedy themselves and just can't bring themselves to forgiveness. They can't, they can't even like, like, I bet you anything that there's people listening this second who are like, man, I don't know. He, I think he's got something special that I don't have. Yeah. I can't, right? Yeah, I you, can't, you, know, you, you know what it is? It was time to free myself. It was time. Say some more on that, please. Because because I'm, I'm, I'm thinking in this moment, you and I are serving somebody out there who isn't hearing that or isn't feeling that, but might need yeah. to hear that right now. So I, I read a quote years ago on Nelson Mandela. Guy gets locked up. We all know who Nelson Mandela is. Gets locked up, spends time in prison. When he's in prison, he says, we will unite. And if, if the guards don't contain our souls, we are free men. So Nelson Mandela got released from prison and what happens? He does an interview and he said, I'm so bitter at the time lost. And he goes, you know what I'm really bitter about is I'm bitter now that I'm out of prison. I'm more bitter now than when I was in prison. So really now that I'm out of prison, I've actually put myself back in prison Wow, yeah. and that's my choice. And I, I'm, I'm out of that now. Mm. So, so that right there, free yourself. And so for me, for yeah. give, but, he, but here's what you got to do. You got to not care about what other people think. The person that you forgive, it's no longer a battle amongst you two. It's no longer a one up. It's no longer. And, and it doesn't mean that you agree with what that individual did. It doesn't mean that mm. you're okay. Mm. Mm. It doesn't mean that, that mm. you think about this. You're not agreeing to be okay with what that person did. Mm -hmm. Instead, what I did is I made a commitment to myself to free me from the cloud, the anger, the bitterness, and all this resentment that was filling my heart and my soul. And I, I made a commitment to get rid of that and be okay. Now, if I forgave my dad and he stood up and pumped his chest and knew I knew you would, I'm right. Okay, that's fine. You can feel that way because you know what it was for me too? It was a sense of, uh, um, empathy. I no longer cared what my dad thought. It wasn't about whether you, I'm not forgiving you, forgiving you so that you feel better about yourself. I don't really care if you're happy. I don't really care if you're sad. I don't really care. I'm forgiving you for me. Your reaction and your choices after this mean nothing to me anymore. I don't care if you think you won. Great. I don't care. I'm freeing myself. That's what it meant to me. Amen to that, dude. Think about, think about <clears throat> your family. Let's assume you've got a family. Divorce, not divorce, but you've got kids. All right, let's just make that assumption. And, and think about how much time you have spent thinking about what you're bitter about in the past mm -hmm. and how much quality time that's taken away from the ones that you really love mm -hmm. because either a you went and sat in a closet or in a room by yourself, just miserable or B you weren't present with that person because in your mind you were thinking about something else. So you might've been there, but you weren't present in the moment. That's a powerful thing. Be okay with it. Come to terms with it. Realize you're not alone. Realize that multiple people have been raped. Multiple people have, endured somebody that has murdered multiple people have been alcoholics, drug addicts, gone through AA, struggled with sex addiction, you name it. Odds are you are not the only one. Mm -hmm. So there's really nothing to be embarrassed about. And the other thing I realized is we're all a little fucked up. Like it's not just me. Like everybody has their struggles. Everybody. Human condition. Everybody has their struggles. It's just being okay with it and, and trying to, work through it and, and make yourself better and make the world better. And, and, and maybe even finding somebody that went through something similar mm. and, and helping each other get through it. 
Well, <clears throat> you know, um, there were a lot of things that I wanted to t ask you about in addition to what we've discussed. I don't want to do that now. I think we just honored, I think this conversation was brilliant and beautiful and in service, hopefully to a whole lot of people. Um, well, that's why I wrote the book because uh, I, I felt that I had a, I had like this epiphany that other people had been through what I'd been through. And um, I think when we share our stories, we can help people. And uh, I, I wrote that book as honest as I possibly could. And uh, I'll say this, if, if you're struggling, if you know somebody that's struggling, if you're looking just for some inner strength or some, um, some one liners that you can maybe take with you to find hope, uh, find forgiveness, find happiness. Um, then I, I really hope that if you read my story that, that you leave with just that. And you will. And here's some of the language I found. <clears throat> this is some of what you said as you were performing the trick in the finals of America's Got Talent. You said, so what I did is I turned to magic and it helped me find myself. It simply taught me don't hate, don't blame and forgive. This is life. When everything is going so perfect and yet tragedy and chaos, they strike when we least expect it. We all face this. But I think the difference is, do we decide? And do we choose to live in vision or do we choose to live in circumstance? And I don't know about you guys, but I wake up every single morning and I choose to live in vision, to find happiness, knowing that life will work its way out and we will all find ourselves. Booyah. There you go, man. I mean, that's some... That's some serious shit, dude. As you're performing a mind-blowing trick on international television. <laughs> Are you ready? For you're this? like, what? You ready for this? And I don't know if it's in the book or not. And I, I probably should because it's my book. <laughs> uh, oh, you know what? It is. It is in my book. Okay. What happened at commercial break? Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> the, this is a, oh, Simon's wife. Can I, can I tell this? Do Please. I tell yeah, it's so beautiful. This is really cool. So, uh, you know, Simon Cowell, he's the judge on America's Got Talent, American uh, Idol. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. He's the hard guy, you know, he's everybody, you know, oh, he's the mean one. <laughs> he was cool as heck to me the whole time. And, and so what happened is I, I do that trick. I, I say what you just read. And at commercial, a woman walks up. Now, what happened is I had all four judges autograph four cards. And I like to keep those. That, those that, that's the way I get autographs from celebrities. I have them sign playing cards, right? It's a, it's a, it's a shameless way of getting autographs, right? <laughs> And their memories for me. And so I had all four judges sign those and, and I was going to keep them. Well, this lady walks up and grabs the one that Simon wrote and he, and he ended up writing his son's name on it. And, and my first reaction was, what the hell? Like, that, I mean, yeah. who just comes up here and like <laughs> does that, right? Like right. you got some nerve. And she goes, can I have this? And I was like, uh, and then all of a sudden Simon walked up, put his arm around her. And that was, you know, that was Eric's mom and that was his son's yeah. mom and, yeah. and the woman he, he's with. And, um, she said, I want to, I want to hang this in my house. And as a reminder that the magic will live in our house forever. Yeah. And the vibe cry. that's going well, on there is because it's like, right. So, so when you read this or if you just watch that, I mean, you can just if you have to find that, right. Can't you just go find that clip that, oh, yeah, well, not yeah. that moment because I was on a commercial break, yeah. but, but you could go watch the trick and listen to the, like, you know, the, the spirit, the vibe, the vibe that you bring, the language. It's like, you're like, Reminding me of like when Carlos Santana in concert goes in his verbal riffs as he's shredding on guitar at the same time. You're like, how the fuck do you do both of those so amazing at the same time? You know, so I'm getting like, I'm like, yeah, the trick's pretty amazing. Actually, that is fucking crazy amazing. How the hell? You, but what I'm digging on more is the vibe you're putting me into right now. Is that your brain? A connectedness. And you always do this. And this is another thing I love about you is that the, 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 like the rants kind of that you go on as you're doing the tricks is they're always so beautiful. It's always about like, like the love you give Alan is something that's, that's, that's pretty awesome. Cool. You know, it's just so like when you put the napkin back together and you're like, because you make us whole, I'm like, God, look at him. Go. <laughs> so good. <laughs> you, you, know, uh, you know, what's crazy is on America's got talent, NBC and all that. They want it scripted out. Like, what are you going to say? Right. Mm. And like, I lightly script it, but I'm like, we'll see. I don't really know. We'll like, see. I'm going to tell you right now. I'm going to get in the moment well, and my heart's going to talk. And, and, I'll, I'll, and they're like, as long as you hit your time and just don't cuss. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay. All right. Got it. Well, you know, um, I want to, obviously I want to thank you so deeply for, for making time today and, and for being so transparent here uh, and helping me in my mission 
brother, which is to serve as many people as I can. And, and, um, I just, the way that you are choosing to show up in the world is, is, is the kind of role model that we all really, really need and choice choice is it, man. You know, we talked so much about forgiveness today. That's a choice. Also happiness. You said it's a choice. It's not an emotion. It's a choice, right? We get to choose. You are a role model for what I believe has to become fundamental curriculum at the earliest levels of all education, which is how to make choices like these. That, that, know, that they are even choices. That and, and, and living and understanding that the story that we tell ourselves, it means something. The words that we use. Um, you know, I, I had a moment where I was traded in the New Orleans Saints. They discovered I had a, an aneurysm in my ascending aorta, a leaky valve. Um, surgery was supposed to be four and a half hours. It was about 11 and a half. Uh, so I went through an 11 and a half hour life-saving emergency open heart surgery. And so I get out of it. Um, and I would, I would take my, uh, I, I was in the hospital for over 30 days post-surgery. Right. So, yeah. um, I would take my, uh, my little, uh, uh, my IV. And then I had this clear suitcase that had tubes that went into my chest that was draining all the fluid into my lungs. Is there a picture of that? Oh yeah. Well, not all that. <laughs> right. But, yeah. The picture of you. Yeah, there it is. Right, you yeah. and and Annalise. Yeah, what, what are you guys doing there? Uh, we we'd walk the halls, man. If if I could make it to the end of the hallway, you know, then I would get a juice box, and it was the greatest juice box ever. That was my reward, you know. Oh. But uh, I, I and and I would shuffle my feet to the bathroom, and I my wife would say, "Don't close that door," because if I fell, she had to come help me. Mm. But I would close the door as much as I could. And that was my moment that I would sit in the mirror and I was defeated. And I'm talking, I sunk in down 30, 40 pounds and just, I just felt defeated. And then I would cry. And then I, I had a moment where I'd wash my face and then I stood up and I held onto my IV and I stared at myself in the mirror and I would talk to myself. I didn't allow self-pity in that conversation. And I would tell myself where we're going and I'd tell myself who I am and what I'm going to do. And that would start my day get out the pity and then talk to myself. You stand up, you hold your head high, you walk proud. And, and, and you brought that vibe, by, you, you brought that vibe though, to, not just to yourself, you started with yourself, but then you went out on these walks, right? Didn't you? And, and, and you brought it to the other people on the unit. Yeah. There was this old man across from me. He had the same surgery. And I, uh, I finally looked in there and he was just looking down grumpy. I said, man, you look like shit. <laughs> and it's, the first, and it's the first time I met this guy. Right. And I look like shit. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, go, Man, I go, you look like shit. And the guy picked his head up and he looked at me like shocked. And he goes, I look better than you do. <laughs> That's great. That's great. But hey, but you, hey, but you know what happened? What? We both had a little laugh. Yeah, amen. Right? Bring it up. And I said, baby. Hey. And I said, I said why, don't you get up? Yeah, why don't you get up with him? Take a walk with me. Let's go get a juice box. <laughs> did he? Oh, yeah, that's what we did. Ah, uh, that's so fun. You know, we, we didn't get to, you have so many good stories. Like the whole story you got about getting traded away from my beloved Eagles. But thank God, because I wouldn't be sitting here right now doing what I'm doing, talking to who I'm talking to if that didn't happen. Now, All right, I'm going I'm I'm to condense this down real quick. Okay. Because it doesn't have a, to be quick. I know I already okay. started to sign off, but who gives a shit? Because there's a beautiful silver lining here that, that encapsulates – everything for this moment mm. at this point in my career i think i'm pretty good uh, i thought i was the best fit for the eagles i thought i was the best player uh for the position i felt i was the best option for my teammates um and all of a sudden in the preseason i started getting benched and in practice i got demoted to second string then third string and i was fucking pissed pissed so I, I have I, I broke a uh, well I have a franchise record for the Eagles for the most consecutive games ever played one six two, yeah one hundred sixty two straight. Now that doesn't include playoffs and all that, so that was season games. Mm. So I actually I actually played more, and I was really proud. I was proud of my job, and I was proud to be there for my teammates. That being said, I started getting resentment from my special teams coach because he was benching me, and I got pissed. So the next thing you know, they say, "Hey, we're going to trade you," and I got pissed. And then I and then I took a second. And I looked at the GM, who yeah, I'm friends with. This is so good. And he thought I was going to blow up, right? <laughs> right? And I go, you're going to trade me? Wait a minute. Has there ever been a long snapper trade? <laughs> <laughs> On the first and, winning. And, and he literally goes. For, for people that don't get that, okay, maybe not football heads, but what, 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 do you, what is it that we're saying here? Like, so what, what so happens? Picture, they don't get traded. Long snappers don't get traded. Yeah, what do they get? get? Cut. They get, we get cut. 
we get fired. Because trading means that you're going to have to give stuff up. And it's right. just people can do that. So, all right, so here, here's what happens. I go to New Orleans. Uh, I play in one game, and then I take my physical. I then find out of my heart condition. At the time, I'm 37 years old. I go from the Northeast to a dome, which is 13 games indoors. Great. All black uniforms, slimming for a 37-year-old pudgy white guy. And my wife and I are really excited for a fresh start. And it, whether I wanted to stay in Philly or not didn't matter. That was my reality. That was happening. The sooner I came to terms with it, the sooner I could see the positive and go into New Orleans. That was, my, that was my reality. So I had to make the best of it. So what happens? All of a sudden, I get my heart surgery. It saves my life. Uh, I was 37. I signed a three-year extension for more money than I'd ever made. So, I, you know, uh, I lost millions in that. Um, but I was alive. And now I'm sitting in the hospital. And now I'm starting to remember the bitterness and the uh, anger and the resentment that I had for a coach that was benching me. And instead, now I have a choice. I can remain bitter and angry and live in that memory, or I can look up and thank him for buying me time. Oof. And what I thought was awful and what I thought I didn't deserve and what I thought wasn't fair and what I thought was fucking wrong mm -hmm. ended up being the best thing Ever. That could possibly happen because I was one hit away. I was one good hit away from getting hit in the chest to dying. Yeah. And every yeah. time he benched me and didn't play me in a game, Same. that bought me time. Yeah. Every time I didn't take a rep in practice, that bought me time. Have you had this conversation directly with him? No. No. Well, hopefully but, we'll watch this. <laughs> but, the, but the bottom line is sometimes – oh, dude. Okay, here's another one. Dude, this is going to blow your mind. So I become friends with Garth Brooks years ago. Okay. And, uh, good start. Long, yeah. Long story short, I love this guy. He's my. He was like. He was like my idol. So like, it was blown away. So now I'm. I'm at a heart surgery. I'm doing a show at Ellen. Uh, there was another situation that came up that you know, didn't really work out for me. It would have been the dream job. It would have been amazing, right? Hmm. And I. And it didn't happen. And I was bummed. But had it not happened, then I would have never been traded to the Saints. I would have never got my surgery. I, I wouldn't be alive. So. Garth comes into my green room and he goes, Hey man, God dang, you look good, man. Heart surgery, this, how you feeling, you know? And, and he, he brought a, uh, it was diet Coke. I had a shot of diet Coke and he goes, uh, Hey, here, here's a toast. You know, when, when I first met you, you said you love the song unanswered prayer. So guess what, buddy? Sometimes what we think we want, sometimes what we think we need, sometimes what we think is right and we don't get it. And those are unanswered prayers and they end up being the best thing that ever happened to us. So cheers to unanswered prayers, man. It, that prayer mm, saved your life, not getting it. Yes. So life happening for us, not to us. Didn't happen to me. It happened for me. Very and it's clearly. up to us to figure out why. You know, and that's a beautiful takeaway, okay, is to have that be a practice, right? Is to have that be a practice, right? Of shifting yourself out of the, the whole happening to me mentality into, uh, okay, I can't see this right now. This shit's going on. I'm not happy about it. Not what I asked for it. Not what I wanted. Somehow this is happening for me. I will discover that. Maybe not in this moment. Maybe not in many moments. But that's, It may take it, years. It may take years. And maybe you'll never discover it. Maybe you'll never discover it. But what? But what happens is the belief mm. in that mm -hmm. changes your short-term perspective on everything around you, mm. putting you on a positive road. And then you vibe out like that to everybody around you, which means you're elevating them, right? Bringing yep. the world up. You know, uh, one of my greatest teachers in life, Dr. Allison Arnold, Doc Alley. She does a lot of, she, she's like the number one mental coach for gymnastics, like on the planet earth. And she used to be my business partner. She helped me start my whole career actually at a graduate school. And she taught me the phrase, we're always either contaminating or purifying the world with our thinking with our vibe, you know? And, that. and that's what I want to thank you for, is because you're bringing it up, man. You are not contaminating. You, you are definitely purifying with the way that you choose to interpret reality and to respond to it. That's the vibe you're putting out. I felt it the first time. You know, it's, it's, it's crazy because the motive of why we do that, I think, changes in our life. And, um, you know, I thought it was a calling, you know, years ago. And, and now I had my little girl and now I'm a girl dad. And now the, the motivation to do things is to make this world as 
great as I can for her when I'm gone. And that, Brother, that motivates you to, man, do things. And, and it's like your legacy, man. It's to make this world better than what it is. And you know what? People that say, oh, I'm just one person. I can't change. Yeah, you can. One person can make a big difference. Big difference. Yeah, amen. And you are certainly doing that. So I, I thank you so much for not just for being here today, but for the way that you're choosing to show up and for all the joy that you're bringing, all the connection and spiritedness, levity, humor, forgiveness, inspiration, motivation, and all the other things that I could go on and on. So way to go, bro. Thanks, man. I really appreciate your making time, man. I hope that we can do it again sometime. Yeah, for sure. You um, know what? Do you still have that dollar and the pencil? Yeah. Can we, can we do it? Yeah. Well, uh, what was the context that we were, um, you were, so you were, Oh yeah. So this is the trail. Oh, oh, I, I got it. I got it. This is, this is great. Are, are, are we rolling? Yep. Let's, yep. All right. So this is actually a trick I saw on television and uh, this was the trick that Elko came and he said to me, he goes, Hey, you know that little stupid trick you do with the dollar and the pencil. And I go, yeah, I actually think it's cool. But anyways, uh, and this, this, I can actually credit this for getting me in the speaking game. Uh, if you take a pencil and a dollar, you can actually jam it through the center. And a lot of people know this, but money is actually, uh, it's cloth, like it's not paper, right? And there's a little ribbon in there. And if you hit this right through, it'll go, this little blue ribbon will pop out. Okay, I missed it, that's okay. Um, but check this out. And I actually didn't go through the center either. It's actually off a little bit. Uh, that's okay. Watch. Here we go. It's taking the pencil and the dollar. Listen. And now we're just as good as <laughs> Uh, here, here's what's really cool. There's no tear. There's no anything. Here's what's wild is that a lot of people actually hear that tear. Um, yeah, yeah. I just heard the tear. Yeah, you think you hear it, right? It, yes. I mean, it's so convincing. But really, uh, you don't even need to tear it. Check this out. We're going to just set this in the center. All right. We're going to set this thing here and fold it. And just, I'm going to try and balance this. So the, I, I learned this, that the eraser of the pencil is actually the same weight as the pencil itself. And you can balance it. Watch this. This time you won't hear anything and you'll just see it go just like that. <laughs> so and, it, great. And, and this can be signed and then you hand it away and uh, that's so it, fun. It's all good. Thanks for you, showing you know, us that. Do you, you um, gotta, uh, -huh, of course. Ta -da. Oh, hey. <laughs> thanks man. This has been so yeah, awesome. Man. Appreciate Anytime. you so much. Not really what you might think of when you think football player, you know, grunt. <laughs> I know it's a sweeping generalization, but there's a reason for sweeping generalizations. Uh, he, he's, not, he's not typical by any stretch. He's extremely atypical. Uh, but, but I say that, and I kind of wish he was still on, because I, 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 can, I suspect that he'd be like, no, no, like, there's nothing special. It's just the choices that I make, right? He chooses, he is really the epitome of uh, what it looks like, right? To choose how you interpret your life. And I love that he brought up, uh, and I always attribute this to Byron Katie, the whole life happens, life isn't happening to me, it's happening for me. And imagine, right, given his circumstance, like I could sit here and chirp all that all day long but here's a, here's a human who has endured some of the most unthinkable, I mean, unthinkable kind of tragedy. And that is his choice on how to uh, respond to life. We need some more John Doran boss. <laughs> I'm just so happy that I get to share him with you. All right, you guys, until next time. Great miracle. <laughs>